Hi, my name is Lisa Ackerman. I'm the Executive Vice President here at World Monuments Fund. And um, I get the fun job of welcoming everybody each time and then taking a seat and listening to the wonderful lecture. And tonight will be the same. Um, before I turn it over to my colleague Norma Barbacci to make the introductions, I just wanted to say a few words about how the Fundadora came into our lives, which was as a nomination to uh, the World Monuments Watch. And when we started the watch in 1996, many of the sites that were on those early years of the watch were very recognizable. Things like uh, the Temple of Hercules in Rome, the Taj Mahal, uh, other famous sites around the globe, Scott's Hut in Antarctica, places that really speak to man's accomplishments on the planet and the beauty of the world in which we live. And as the watch has evolved, and as the preservation field has thought more and more broadly about what is heritage and what are monuments, we have found ourselves often talking about things that are very unlikely iconic images in our midst. And I think Fundadora Park in Monterey is one of those places that we might not in 1996 have thought of an abandoned blast furnace as something that could evoke beauty and be a source of education. But I think as we'll learn tonight, and as those of us on the staff certainly learned during the World Monuments Watch deliberations, um, this is indeed a monument in every sense of the word, something that was part of the great industrial revolution of the country, um, brought great economic benefits, even if it had a short life, and now is bringing all new kinds of benefits to the community as a green space and a place of learning and a place of gathering. And with that, I want to say how happy we are that it's on the 2014 World Monuments Watch and that we've had a chance to learn a bit about it. And we were even um, happier a few weeks ago when we learned that American Express would give one of its preservation grants to Fundadora Park. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Norma Barbacci and then to our colleagues from Mexico. Hello and welcome. Um, I was priv privileged to actually have been at uh, Fundidora a, a couple of months ago and was there when they celebrated the watch day, which you will see uh, a video about. Uh, it's a fascinating place. Um, it was originally the iron factory known as Aceros de Monterrey, and it turned off its furnaces in 1986 after more than 80 years, I'm sorry, eight decades of activity during which thousands of workers operated nonstop all the furnaces that um, and other equipment that now remain as the main attractions of the Fundidora Park. Um, the Industrial Archaeology Park features many structures and heavy machinery, but none is as impressive as Orno 3 of the Blast Furnace Number no. 3, which was the last of the blast furnaces. It was built in 1968, and the original uh, factory had an uh, area of 114 hectares and contain worker housing, a school, a hospital, several industrial buildings, and three enormous blast furnaces, um, of which Orno 1 and 3 still remain and are listed as national artistic monuments. Thanks to the effort of a private public consortium, the industrial site was clean and it was opened as a public park in 2001. And subsequently, five of the structures were converted into cultural centers. In 2007, the Orno Tres structure was opened as a science and technology museum after two years of work that combined conservation of as, mu as much of the original fabric as possible and a sensitive introduction of new materials. The architecture is spectacular. The exhibits are state of the art and the museum is really well attended and a popular venue for um, many events. However, after seven years of operation, the exposed iron structure is starting to show decay and the resources generated by this non-for-profit organization that manages the site and its many educational programs are not enough to cover the expense of the comprehensive conservation treatment is, is needed. It is for this reason that Orno Tres and Fundidora Park were included on the 2014 World Monuments Watch. Orno Tres has conservation needs, but it is also a model of best practices for the preservation and interpretation on the industri of industrial sites. Its public education programs, which focus on science, heritage, and climate change, are already showing tangible results as indicated by the dramatic increase in the percentages of Orno 3 students that stay in school 
go to university and choose science as a career of choice, which is the main goal of the museum. Uh, in August, on August 10, 2014, Orno Tres celebrated its seventh anniversary with a World Monuments Watch Day public program, which you will see in a video after, after the lecture. And at the closing of the program, a grant from American Express through WMF was publicly announced, as was the launch of a public campaign to raise additional funds to support the much needed conservation work. The American Express Award will support a conservation project and a signage project, which is part of an awareness raising campaign um, designed to create a sustainable level of support to maintain the park as a central place in the city of Monterrey. Now I would like to present uh, Luis Lopez Perez, who is the director of the museum, or, uh, Museo del Acero Orno Tres, and he was trained as an engineer and was responsible for the development of the museum since its original conception. Marta Piñeiro Morcos, is in charge of the visitors program and the daily operations at the museum. She received a degree in arts by the Universidad de Monterrey. And Claudia Fernandez Limon, who is in charge of the development, implementation, and measuring of the impact of the programs at the museum. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's and a PhD degrees in education. Welcome, Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for, com for coming. First, I would like to thank you, World Monument Fund, for their hospitality to American Express for their support. Sorry, because my English is not that good. Blas Fornas number three and Fundidora Park were included in the watch list 2014 we were very happy about this, since it, uh, it is the first industrial heritage site of the state of Novo Leon to be considered. Monterrey, the state's capital, became the industrial detonator of Mexico. At the end of the 19th century, Fundidora Monterrey established it in 1900, changed, changed the destiny of the landscape of the city. Now, as La Maestranza, as the workers became, became high-skilled working there, the sons and grandsons of the workers were like a family, the steel family. They studied in company, lived in the houses of the company, schools, and uh, make a career inside the factory for 86 years. Everyone in Monterey, and I mean, almost everyone has a relative working there. Um, Marta Piñeiro, please. Hi, well, as Luis just said, everyone in Monterrey used to have someone working in Fundidora. And um, perhaps I should uh, say that I'm going to try to be as objective as I can since I was raised and born, in, born and raised in Monterrey. So I'm very proud of, the, of working there and to see this place transform into a new place. So, well, this is a picture, a photograph of the early 20th century. And this mountain is a symbol of the city. Cerro de la Silla, and we like this photograph because it shows how at the beginning of the 20th century, Monterrey was not, not such a small city, but it wasn't so, so big. And very near from where we are now, there used to uh, grow, grow vegetables there. So this is the Blast Furnace number one. And Fundidora Monterrey that was founded in 1900 was the first uh, steel in, uh, industry in all Latin America. This was the, the first blast furnace of all the Latin American co um, continental. And um, you can see how, well, the city started to grow around this place. This is a, a, a panoramic of the factory nearly <coughs> the end of the 80s, once the, the factory was closed. <coughs> and this is blast furnace now recovered as a museum. So you can see that the place changed a lot. and. Uh, the story of the of this site is that it was a, a private factory, then in the 70s becomes an estate factory. And at the end of the 
1986, it was closed because it was declared in a bankruptcy. And since then, the state of Nuevo León tried to recover the, the land to transform it into a park somewhere where the people from Nuevo León can go and do some exercise, have some leisure, and, and have some uh, place to, to have like Central Park in New York while we have the Fundidora Park in, in Monterrey. So I'm going to just say, uh, go around some photographs to try to say how we recovered the place, how we restored the place, and how it was transformed into a science center. This is the blast furnace in 2005. The, stat the state of the place was pretty much a ruin. So a lot of work had to be done. And the most important thing is that the, we didn't want just to restore the structure because after several years, it was going to be the same thing again. So we want to, to keep it alive. And the only way to keep it alive was to transform that into a museum. And, and, and I'd like to define Orno Tres as more than a museum because we have something for the people who like the history of the site, something for the people who are just tourists and are looking around and sightseeing. And the most important part is about the science center. We try to inspire kids and, and young people in, to get into science and to choose such a science career. That is what Mexico needs to, to, to have a quicker development. So as you can see, it was very, very, very in, in a bad situation. You can see some um, close-ups from the structure. This is uh, the cast house where the furnace is and the top of the furnace that now it's uh, possible to, to walk around. But the most important thing was that even that since the site wasn't cataloged as a, as a heritage, as a monument of the country, as a national monument, uh, it was restored taking care of that like if it was a monument. So even that the concept of industrial heritage is very young in Monterrey and in Mexico, the, the restorer tried to respect the site as it was a colonial church, a cathedral, or even a um, a pre-Columbian ruin. You can see that it was almost dangerous to be around, so it was actually close around. It, was, it wasn't possible to walk around. Right. And the, something important, or some of the criteria that the restorer took was to have a very respectful intervention. Pretty much the 90% of the structure remains the same. They only have to take away some uh, pipes and beams that was dangerous for the public. So you can see how they work space by space, d deciding the architects and the restorer and the designers which parts should they st uh, rescue and which ones should be uh, retired. And the most important thing is that whatever we did, the most important is that the place has to become a safe place for, for visitors. So it's not so easy because this wasn't a place designed for visitors. So every uh, Every column, every beam was uh, tested, ultrasound tested, to, to be sure that it was safe. All the, the rust and the dirt and everyone was uh, removed by hand. So perhaps it was going to be quicker or even cheaper to sandblast the structure, but we decided to clean it by hand and then to, to let the building tell the story they have. They work, it worked for more than 20 years and it was abandoned for almost 20 years. So the idea was that the visitors can read that or tell that by just watching the structure. Okay. That's how they were working. You can see at the bottom, at the top of that picture, how they w were already noticing the change of, of the structure. Okay. You can see an after and a before picture of the, the stoves of the furnace. And something that, that wasn't very easy is that there's no very much uh, literature or, or, or papers of how to restore a site like this one. So the architect has to make tests, to talk to engineers, to talk to scientists, to, see, to find out the best, uh, the best thing to do to preserve the site. Okay. This is another after and before. You can see at the, at the end of the, uh, the, the photograph, Blast Furnace number one, that uh, was the first of Latin America. And ours was uh, last furnace number three. There was a second furnace that didn't survive to the closure of the, of the factory. And here we can see how they have to retire everything that was uh, dangerous, how they clean it, how they were painting it. Okay. And we can see how it, the, the transformation to, to, to get the site a, a, a safe place was going on. And well, how, how the concept was developed. How the most important thing is that Fundidora was known as the Maestranza, since Maestranza in, Espanol, in Spanish means where someone goes to 
become a a master in something, some whatever, uh, uh, any any craft. So, my stance was to Monterrey, the place where every worker, people who came from the countryside, transformed themselves into very skilled hard um, hard worker people. Very skilled, they become first technicians, then engineers, and and this is the the way the city changed and and become more technified city. Okay, and well, this is a panoramic of the park and and some of the buildings that survived when the factory was closed. And the experience was designed first uh, by Aldrich Pierce Associates. It's an exhibit designer company from Vancouver, Canada. <coughs> and uh, the architectural project was by Grimshaw Architects here in New York and Oda Oficina de Arquitectura in Monterrey. And something that was very um, nice is that even that those firms are foreign, they were very uh, fond and they find that they, they get the idea of how important this place was for the city since the beginning. So they were very respectful with the structure. They understood, for example, the, the architects that all what they design as a new structure shouldn't be more uh, spectacular than the furnace itself. The most important part of our collection is the furnace itself. So everything, the rest, it's around the furnace. Okay. This is how they start working in designing the, the the tours of the people, where we were going to have the, a history gallery, a steel gallery, how the visitors will walk around the site, some of the first designs the architects, the architects did of the site. Okay. And well, pretty much it, it was uh, from the outside, the place remains the way it has for in, the, in the urban landscape for the last 20 years. So all the new interventions and the new designs were very, very, um, very subtle. Uh, some are underground, as you can see here, and some other. The new ones were very, very, very simple. So the something very important is that the, all the teams that worked in, in this thing were uh, multicultural, several uh, professions: designers, architects, uh, historians, educators. Everyone worked together to risk to rescue and restore the place and to transform it in, in an interesting experience for, for the people for, of Monterrey, but also for the rest of the people of Mexico. Here are some of the first designs of, of Aldrich Pierce. Several uh, meetings here in Vancouver, in Monterrey, in New York, Mexico City, etc., because there were people working all around in, in, into the project. And something that is very interesting is that some parts of the of the gallery, for example, in the history gallery, or I, I'm going to explain later what we have there, but we didn't want to have like an anonymous people telling the story. We wanted people with names and last names like myself telling the story of the site and telling the story of the place and how they used to work there and how, for example, in, in the steel gallery that is the Science and Technology Center, how they young people can become very... Um, to understand that scientists are not just someone hidden in a laboratory, they're, they're, they're people like us, okay? So here they are interviewing some former workers and some of, there's a lot of video and, and, and media around the, the site and you can see that they went to the actual factories that still work in Mexico to have images as real as they are, okay? We don't want to, to make uh, um, just animations or something that looks like, but to get the real thing. There are two structures that the architect, architect designed to, to the museum. This is the, the roof of the steel gallery. And I just can't get the name in English, but it's something like Cubierta Arquitectónica Poliedrica. That means an architectural cover that is very, very uh, with different shapes. And this works like in steel, but <coughs> imagine an, a paper origami. And depends on how you fold the paper, the structure becomes stronger. So this is not just an ornamental thing, it's actually a structure. In the top there's a green roof, and in the bottom we have the steel gallery. Everything, of course, is made of steel. And something important is that one, once Grimshaw architects start designing the place, Monterrey has a very extreme uh, weather. In, in the winter it's cold and the summer is very hot, so they they, we needed to, to make the building very sustainable because it's very expensive to, for example, keep it nice inside to have uh, air conditioning. So this place doesn't need to be so cold because this, the, the, the design helps uh, keep it cool or, or, or warm in the winter. This is the green roof. 
of the green roof has local plants, so there's less money invested on, 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 cons on preserve that, that garden. This is the helical stairs. And well, the design of the helical stair and the production of that is it was as complex and as difficult as a piece of art. It's, it's actually in a sculpture, it's, it's not just in the stairs. You can see it here, how they had to make um, every, every piece one by one and then to, to test the, the structure and then, well, how it looks at, at the museum. And, well, the experience of the museum is, uh, it was designed with four main experiences. Now we have a fifth experience. But the history gallery, as I was telling you, is not just the history of the factory or not just the history of the steel industry in Mexico. It's how the steel industry changed the life of the people of the cities where they have factories. This is the case of Monterrey, but it's also the case of Veracruz, Monclova, um, Michoacán, etc. So here uh, is where I was telling you that we don't have an anonymous n uh, narrator. We have people with names and, and last names that tell you the story. And what we want to do with this is that to help audiences understand that um, this is part of their life. Uh, there's a, it's very uh, common that we have a visitor that find a grandfather or an uncle or a friend in the historical pictures of, of photographs of, at the gallery. Okay. And it's designed in a way that depends on how much time you want to spend in there. You can just have a, 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 a quickly sight of the site, or you can read, or you can listen to interviews, or you can see uh, videos with some other uh, testimonials of former workers. The Steel Gallery is the one that is actually the science center. And the steel process is just the excuse to teach science and technology. So for example, at the beginning of the process where we can, we need to explain how the mining for the steel industry is, well, th the thing is that our visitors can learn about uh, minerals and how a geologist work. And, and as, as much as they go into the center of the gallery, they understand just science related to that part of the process. So at the very outside part of the gallery, we have a diagram that just explain you from uh, iron ore to a paper clip or to a string for a guitar. But in the middle of the gallery, you can get into science. We have the, an experience that it's called the Sleeping Giant. And this is because the place was a Sleeping Giant. It, it, it worked for 20 years and it was abandoned, just waiting there something for, for something to happen. And this is a, a light and sound show that recreates how the foreigners used to work. And again, the, the ones who told the story are workers. So it's like a, a kid listening to a grandfather telling the story of what happened there. And it's actually where the public understand what used to happen in, in, in the foreigners. Okay. And the other one is um, the catwalk adventure experience. And it's not just about going to the top of the furnace. It's about understanding the place as, a, as an industrial heritage site. So you can walk at several levels of the structure. You can go through these lifts to, to see the city, to understand the rest of the structures of the park, what they did when the factory was uh, working, and also to understand the horizon of Monterrey. So you can enjoy <coughs> the view of the mountains and, and see some other buildings, some other uh, factories of the city. Okay, so and now I'm going to uh, let the, the mic to Claudia, who is in charge of uh, all the education programs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you today um, because we love to share our, our experience. Horno Tres is an inspirational place. It's an inspirational place as, as, as it was before. People learn there that the science is all around us, but kids learn that science and engineering careers can be an option in their lives. What Mexico is facing too many problems as poverty, school drop, violence. So we are a group of dreamers that believe that we can change the course of Mexico through education. And we're going to do it because we are having the, best, the, the first results now. So we really think that we can change through science education. We create science environments in formal and in non-formal settings. This science edu education is all around STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, all the time. Kids, we have every day like 700 kids, more or less, 
and we we exert a provoking impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. they, they they go we're like wow, what's happening inside here? Science is amazing. We want to th that they feel that it's, it's something that they feel. Sometimes they don't learn, but they feel something different, and we love that experience. Kids learn, as Marta said, the industrial process, how things are made. For example, from a watch, a paper clip, an airplane. They go to the mines and they work as uh, they work as miners. So they have a, a cool experience there. We all we have from preschool to college students, and they learn that science is all around them. But the most important thing is that we want to keep these faces. We want to keep those faces, those surprise faces, those jaw dropping that they say, wow, that's wonderful to be here. That's wonderful to share the science experience. We have science demonstrations all the time. These uh, can be repeated at home very easily. So they, they, they become in creation, they self creation, self learning at home. So teachers become like the teacher, the students become like the teachers in their families. So it's like a science experience in the family. We have different places to have the demonstrations. We also have families all the time uh, with, the, with exhibits that kids learn that uh, they can have an experience with the family together. And these exhibits uh, uh, lead the, the children to ask questions, to solve problems, to be curious, and, and many more things. The most important thing that kids learn with interactive exhibits is that uh, they learn that failure is not failing that they need to fail many times to get success. That failing one, two, three, four times sometimes is a way to learn and to do things in another way or in a better way or to change the way things are done because the, the world has changed because of those people that have changed the way that things are done. So we try to, the children live that experience at Orno Tres. And we all learn in different ways. So we have all the kind of exhibits. Sometimes people go by themselves. Sometimes they prefer to go and chat with other people. Sometimes they prefer to feel the place or to have a, a science experience. But we provoke all those activities. We try to design all family activities because we really believe that behind a science, this, there is a family that pushed the science to grow. So we have family activities. So they have fun. They have the mother, the father, the kids, and they have fun. When they interact with these activities, they can share that activities at home. They learn the, lang the language of science, and they can uh, have a, like an experience, like a different experience at home. So it's like very fun for the family to repeat these activities and to talk about what happened and to try to do that at home or with extended family. Kids love. To, to build robots, but grandparents too. In Mexico, it's very hum common to have extended families together. So we design activities for the whole family. We have the whole family together sometimes. We have different generations. So we have decided different activities for the whole group together. Kids uh, learn to ask questions, a lot of questions, and we never give answers to them. We ask more questions. So they say, wow, you don't answer the questions. No, we will never do that. You have to figure that out. You have to think in a very different way. We try that kids design new things, like the first uh, picture. That, and the most important thing that we try that kids uh, feel is that they get very proud of their creations, that there is not a bad solution to a problem, that it could be a different solution, and to be very proud of what they did in a certain period of their time. Seven years ago, Luis and I went with the dean of one of the most important universities in the city. And we said, we, uh, we want to, to design some workshop for kids. And they say, no, we don't do that. We work with college students. We can go to high school, but we never do for young children. So we will do that because we're going to, to feed your engineers in the future. We're going, we're going to feed people with different kind of, of thinking to go to the universities to study science or technology careers. So now we have some very strong partnerships with all the universities uh, in the state. We have worked with all the universities. We have designed a sustainability program. This is 40-hour workshop for kids, and kids learn their, the impact of their decisions. Sometimes they are political, cultural, economical, ecological de decisions. We have another program that is called Green Architecture. In this program, kids learn to build friendly houses around, according to the environment, and they learn to design cities. Sometimes I wish these kids would have uh, born before us, 
because the city will be better. I know, I know, because they know what's happening in the cities. They know the problem that a city is facing. We have robotics program too. It's a very successful program. All the time, we work with multi-age groups. We have kids from five years to 15. Sometimes the mothers of the younger, they get like, hey, they're too old to be in this group, the teenagers. No, don't worry, they're going to work fine. And they become sometimes best friends. It's wonderful for kids because we foster cooperation, never competition. So it's wonderful for the kids to, to get along with others. To, with, they see that uh, younger kids have some skills, that older kids have others, and they learn to share those skills, and that's great for them. They learn to build robots and to solve a problem, to solve different problems with robotics, and we have different teams. Now we have a FCT uh, team, it's called in first, and we went to the World Championship competition the last uh, year. It was our first year in a, in a worldwide competition, and we were very happy because kids did it by themselves. We have mechatronics. In mechatronics, they design their project on paper, they, they build it, and they test it. And it's just hard work for them because sometimes they go back again to the paper and they have to build that again, and too many times, and that's part of the learning. We have chemistry too. Chemistry, they learn to, uh, to, for example, to prepare toothpaste or shampoo or whatever. They put in bottles, they can it, or they put the label, they, they check the price. And so they are joint entrepreneurs. So does our country need that? Need people that go with that kind of, of thinking in, in the future? But the most important thing that kids learn is to observe. They learn to observe, to be very careful of what's around, around them. They learn in medicine too. They learn how their body works. We work, actually there are pig organs, right? There's no human organs. <laughs> they learn that. So when kids understand how their body works, they stop eating junk food. That's it. That's the solution. The mother said, well, we want the medicine program again. Yes, it works. But when we understand how our body works, we change our way of living. And that's what, what they do at Medicine Workshop. We have had 3,500 children in this program, and we do a very strict follow-up of each one of them. So we have some pretty good results. 99% of the students increase motivation to continue school. And this is very important because we have a very high drop school in Mexico, so we have 99%. 90, 91 increase school grades, not because school grades are, are important for us, but they are important for children to continue their education, their formal education. 96 increase their interest in science. 99 remember after five years what they learned in the workshop. So that's amazing. We, we sometimes say, we want that teachers can do that. We hope that teachers could do that. And we ask an open question to the parents and we say, what are the skills more developed in your kids? And they say interpersonal skills, observation, problem, solution, and self-learning. We all wish we could have those skills developed at early age. Of our alumni from the, from the different courses, 18% are at college now, and 17% are in high school. From the 18% that are at college, 76 selected science or engineering careers. So we're doing that now. We have a very small group now. We need to expand the group. But we can see the first results. We work with teachers too. We started our teachers program four years ago because we really think that we need to work with teachers because they are the key point. We can work with some kids, but with the teachers we can work with indirectly with more kids. So uh, teachers learn science because sometimes the teachers are not very fluent in science, so they uh, learn science directly from the science people, from different science people of the different universities. But the most important thing that, that teachers learn is to have a joy in science, to enjoy science, to live science. And when they have that in their heart, they can have that to their children. We have different programs. Sometimes uh, we have very low income areas in our state. So we go to, with different programs, to the south part of the state. It's a rural, very low income uh, place. Sometimes it's the most important activity in the year for that area. So it's wonderful we, we take some of the programs of Fort Notre there. We work at malls too. 
we put our table and we do science there, science experiments. It's fun. Sometimes Saturday afternoon on, on Sunday afternoon, families, they don't know what to do with their kids. They go to the mall. Well, they, they got science there too. We go to parks. But we love to see these faces, these happy faces all the time, interest faces, focus faces, doing a, trying to think that they can do science very well. We accept all. And we all can accept science. Because we all have a child and a scientist inside us. We have discovered that. We love to see that families working through science in a very fun, because science is amazing. And to teach science is wonderful. And to have a language conversation with science is great. So our nutrients is a result of business leaders, business people, dreamers like us, that we, really change, that, we, that we really think that we can change the course of Mexico through science education. We are having the same results. We need help to expand our programs. We need continue needing help for the, for the site because we are in the most wonderful site in Mexico. So we, we are continue working to fundraising activities with fundraisers. We, we are, have done a lot of job to do that. So we're very thankful to American Express for the donation. And we really thank Norma Barbach and the team in World Monuments Fund for this opportunity to be here with you and to share a little bit of what Orno Tres is. Thank you. Okay, so um, what, thanks to the donation of American Express and, and to the help of the World Monuments Fund, we are going to uh, implement two programs. The first is to work on the conservation of the structure. You can imagine that a steel structure is not an easy thing to preserve since it's always fighting through uh, the weather and humidity and so it's always rust around plus uh, pollution in the city. So we are going to use part of this donation to work on the restoration of the main uh, furnace place, not the stuffs, but the, the, the crisol. How is crisol say that? Well, the, 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 the melting pot, if, if I can say it some, somehow. So we're going to work on that part. You can see the state of, of the site now, even though that seven years ago was very, very carefully clean and, and preserved and that. So we have to always keep, keep on working on that. And the other part is something very important, well, very important to us because, as I told you, the, the, the concept of industrial heritage is very new, not just in Mexico, but in Monterrey is like super new. So we're working on a sign and signing project. So people from all around Monterrey, the, the neighboring states, once they go through Monterrey or go to the city, they can find out that we, we have something different from the rest of Mexico's uh, archaeology sites. So we want them to know that they should stop, at least in, in Fundiora Park, and to get to know uh, Orno Tres and, and the Blast Furnace. Um, so we're working on, on that, and I think it's going to be very helpful on the idea of uh, communicating what is an, an industrial heritage site. Okay. And we, are very, we, were, we were really, really happy last year when we were included into the World Monuments Watch. And as Norma said, we just celebrated our watch day in August. And uh, we're going to see a video of, of what we did that day. We also celebrate our seventh anniversary. And we wanted to, to, to celebrate the watch day in the summer because it was holidays for all the school boys in, in, in the city. So a lot of people can participate in that. So all I need is help to choose the video in the computer. And it's a short video, it's around uh, six minutes. And maybe at the end, if you have any questions or want to talk about a little bit of what we do, just ask us. Okay. El siglo XX trajo consigo el inicio de una nueva era industrial para Nuevo León y México. Creándose así, en 1900, fundidora de fierro y acero de Monterrey. Con la creciente demanda de acero se hizo necesaria la modernización, dando paso a la construcción del horno alto número 3. <coughs> el cual inició sus operaciones en 1968.
small groups that we can also invite people to talk to you all individually over refreshments, but it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you all so much. Um, it really, I mean, I can't believe that people aren't astonished when they come and see the transformation. It must be quite something for people in Monterey to remember it as a working glass furnace, know that it was derelict, and then see you know, what it's become today, which must be beyond everyone's imagination. But um, I think because we all know what a struggle it can be like this, I wonder if there's, you know, for a parting word, if there was one thing that was the biggest surprise in the work you've done uh, in these last few years. Anything that just, you know, um, you weren't <laughs> prepared for or that shocked you in a really great way. <coughs> show and there's a poem that we found in all in the old boxes there was a poem and we didn't have the initial the letter of the initials of the last name of a, of a guy that wrote the poem and we started to do that and we have the poem there and it's one of the most important pieces activities at Ornos Res and go have that, that poem and the initials that we have that and then one day, say, oh, one old man came. He was like 85 years old. And he said, "Well, I wrote that. I wrote that. It was fun." And he was in the middle and to, to recite the poem. Oh, oh yes. And the mystery was solved because he finally found out what the meaning yeah. was. So well, that's fantastic. Well, I think that is the perfect ending story because nothing yeah. could be better than that. What an amazing experience. Thank you again. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you.